Let's see. Well, it looks like we've hit 701. I know there's a few more people still joining, but I will go ahead and start with some introductions and a little bit of overview. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Maya Swope, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator with Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. We're really excited to be hosting this book launch event tonight um, and to be with David and Doug here um, for a really interesting conversation. Um, I've read portions of this book. It's, it's really great to get some more insight into Sigurd Olson's work and would, would recommend anyone interested in it to do the same. Um, a few just kind of housekeeping notes. Um, we are having folks enter into the chat, just their name and where they're watching from. I would love for any newbies to um, continue doing that as you join. We also do have a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation and throughout the conversation, please feel free to enter those into that feature and we will um, get to as many of those as we can towards the end because um, we'd love to hear from you and hear, you know, kind of what you're wanting to know about this. If anyone has technical issues or other things like that, you can send me a message in the chat. Um, you can send me a direct message there and I can try to help you figure that out. Um, I believe that is all of the kind of technology overview. Um, I want to also mention that um, you can buy the book. It is now for sale. Um, and I do have kind of a, a code for 40% off that you can order this book. I will put all of those details in the chat, but it's available for sale through the University of Minnesota Press. Um, and there's also a few other titles that this discount code will work for. So um, once we get started, I will, I will add that to the chat as well. Um, I want to introduce you to two wonderful and interesting folks here. I'm excited to hear from them. Um, David Backus, he is the editor of this book. Um, he's also somewhat of an expert in Sigurd Olson. Um, he's written A Wilderness Within, The Life of Sigurd Olson, and is also the editor of Olson's The Meaning of Wilderness, um, uh, Essential Articles and Speeches. And he's also um, a retired professor of journalism and communication um, from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and is joining us from Milwaukee today. Um, Doug Wood is also here um, to help facilitate and lead some of this conversation. They are close friends with a long history and a long interest in Sigurd Olson. Um, and Doug in his own right is a best-selling author. He's won many wonderful awards, um, literary awards um, and you know, other things in Minnesota. So excited to hear from both of them. Um, I am going to um, kind of hide my view and turn off my microphone. And David, I will just turn it over to you. Thank you. And uh, before I start here, I, I saw one of the people here I want to give a shout out to, Parker Palmer. I am honored that you are watching this. I loved your book, The Courage to Teach. It's one of my all time favorites. Uh, so anyway, I am going to take you guys on a little bit of a slideshow. Yes, technology. When I uh, wrote this book, The Life of Sigurd Olson, A Wilderness Within, I spent about three years doing the research for it, and then another three years of writing, and then a year of waiting around for it to come out. And in August of 93, it was the end of that three years of research, and I, I was ready. And uh, there was just one thing that had bothered me. I'd looked at all of Sigurd's papers. I had interviewed dozens and dozens of people, uh, many hours with Elizabeth and other family members. But I had seen in his private journals in the writing shack references to earlier journals that started in 1930. And I hadn't seen anything before 1937. And I was a little bit concerned what happened to those first seven years of journals. I had reached the point by August 93 that I thought they must just be gone. And so I, I was going up to Ely. Elizabeth had just moved to the nursing home in Hayward. Bob and Bonnie were at the house in Ely beginning to sift through things. So I called them when I got up there, as I always did, and uh, said, Bob, I can't stand looking at this stuff anymore. I have to start writing. He said, well, I've got something that's gonna disappoint you then. What? 
I have found the first seven years of Dad's journals. I said, what, where? They, he said they, they were in a cardboard box at the back of an unplugged refrigerator in the basement. <laughs> and he was a saver, but not an organizer. And uh, I was so happy to get those journals because they made all the difference in the world. But if you notice, the main part of the title is Wilderness Within. This one is A Private Wilderness. There's a lot more to Sigurd Olson than meets the eye. And those journals became the key. And when I read through that whole batch of seven years, plus all of the others, I thought someday this has to be a book. And I didn't know that it would be this long after the uh, biography, but nevertheless, I, I really wanted to do this book. Well, six journals, he typed them out a lot as this one is on Border Lakes Outfitting Company uh, stationery. In this case, he would use anything. He'd type it on stationery. He'd type it on the back of a school exam, uh, blank sheets of paper, or he'd handwrite them too. He didn't always type. I was grateful for when he typed because his handwriting could be very hard to read. Uh, and he didn't bind them in anything. He just stuck them in folders and they're all loose leaf. And so things are out of order. You, you have to really sift through things. In fact, he might write, let's say this one is dated July 26, 1934. He might write on the back of that note, eight years later, another note. And, and so you have to sift through all of that and organize it and try to figure out who is this person? One of the things I think that's essential to try to get to know Sigurd Olson is to remember that most of us, we know him because we've read his books, we've loved his books. We may know him for his environmental work, his uh, all of the work on behalf of establishing national parks and wilderness areas all across the continent. But underneath all of that, underneath the icon who we all came to know and revere is a real human being. And uh, the journals will help reveal that. But for me, when I was writing about him, uh, oftentimes the pictures could help as well. Just little ones like this. This was taken at Picnic Point in Madison in 1919. Saint Elizabeth are dating. She's 21 years old there. He's 20, 20 years old. Look at him. This is on their honeymoon. It took a three week canoe trip into Boundary Waters. It was her first canoe trip, his second. Quite an adventure. There they are a little bit later, cross country skiing. Uh, they did lots of outdoor things together. And then another side of Sigurd, father, 1923, Sigurd Jr. is born. Two years later, Bob is born and then they start doing family things together, family canoe trips, family fishing. And as the boys got older, hunting. These times together in the outdoors were among the, the best memories that any of them had. They were lots of fun. And that was quite a contrast to the stories about his writing. We have Sigurd pursuing three different kinds of careers in a sense of who was he? Who was he supposed to be? This is 1926. He's the second guy there with the tall hat. Uh, he's guiding a canoe party in the Boundary Waters from 1923 through 1928. He spent virtually the entire summer away from home and in, in the wilderness. He'd come back between trips, maybe a night, maybe two nights, rarely more than that. Uh, the family had no problems with that. Sig loved it. Then in January 1929, he and two other men bought out an outfitting company and renamed it the Border Lakes Outfitting Company. Sigurd became the... Um, Man, he, the manager of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And that meant in the summertime, he no longer was out all of the time. He was oftentimes behind his desk and that started to rub him raw. That was one of the thorns that he had to deal with. Then you have Sigurd the scientist. This was another 
aspect. Should he become a scientist, maybe become a professor at a university? Here he is doing uh, research on the timber wolf for his master's thesis. He came 1931-32, he went down to the University of Illinois and did the world's first graduate thesis on the timber wolf, and he hated it. You'll, you'll see as you uh, read the book, one of his entries where he says, I hate the very sound of the word ecology. He, he hated the, the, the discipline of it, the having to keep track of all the statistics and the numbers and the data, and it just felt artificial to him. And yet he couldn't quite give it up. And you'll see one of the challenges that he goes through over this period of time chronicled in his journals is uh, people like Aldo Leopold. Leopold asked him in 1934 to come down to Madison and be his first doctoral student. Sig agonized for months over this, as he did on many other occasions. Uh, should he do this or not? He already knew that he hated the very sound of the word ecology, but he almost talked himself into doing it. Then there's Sig the teacher. Now this uh, started at the high school. And then after he got his master's degree, he began teaching at Ely Junior College. There were parts of this that he genuinely enjoyed. He felt at times, he really felt the connection with the students. Students tended to really like Sigurd and be drawn to him. Uh, but he was at his happiest when he could take them out for first-hand experiences in the field somewhere, geology, ecology. And he hated it when they were stuck inside. And that was one of the thorns in his side. It didn't give him enough contact with the outdoors. And he didn't feel like it was expressing what was in him. Somehow, Despite that, he convinced himself to take on the position of Dean of the Junior College, and for a dozen years, he was in utter torment. He was doing something that he hated, and he did it out of a sense of, I'm not even sure, partly duty, I suppose, uh, partly a sense that uh, maybe this was what he was meant to do, but he hated it. What he wanted to do was be this guy, Sigurd Olson, the writer. This one and the next two pictures are all shots taken from a 1941 promotional photo shoot for a syndicated column that he got to write for several years called America Out of Doors. And this captures the, the rugged outdoors man, which is a very true image for sure. Uh, but he wanted to be known as that and the philosophical writer. And so this was the challenge, and at the heart of his journals is his struggle for what he calls his medium, the kind of writing that he can do that can allow him to quit the junior college, which he doesn't feel he's meant to be doing, and support his family and satisfy this creative longing inside of him, this calling that he felt he had. He had this deep philosophical side to him that had to get out. It was an aesthetic side as well. Uh, he was so entranced by beauty that he would write notes about how it pained him sometimes to see such a beautiful sunset because he couldn't adequately describe it and it drove him nuts. He, it felt that it, it, it hurt him. He used that word, it hurt him that he couldn't describe what he was feeling. And he struggled over that for a long time. And so in the 19, from the late 1920s through the 30s and into the 40s, he became known among readers of outdoor life, field and stream and sports and field as a, a, a writer of hunting and fishing stories. He did these easily. They paid very little. He couldn't quit the junior college and try to make enough money to support his family doing that for sure. Even if he kept the outfitting company as a side business, which he thought about doing. Instead, he had to find a way to make money. And his, his friends who were writers, some, some of them he guided into the canoe country, they told him the only way you're gonna make enough money to live off of is to write short story fiction. And so for 20 years, he tried writing fiction, 
short stories for Saturday Evening Post, The Atlantic, other national feature magazines like that. And it is God awful stuff. It's horrid writing. And he got scathing rejection letters and deservedly so. It was terrible. He could not write fiction. And he, he knew it and he struggled with it because he felt he had to do it in order to be able to become the writer that he was meant to become. Because when he tried writing what was really in his heart, the kinds of things he became known for, uh, the essay style of writing, for example, uh, Grandmother's Trout, Easter and Prairie, Farewell to Saginaga. He wrote these in the 1930s. It became famous later in the 50s with his first book. In the 30s, he sent them out and the editors would say, we really like how you wrote these, Mr. Olson, but there's no market for this. And so the one thing that felt deepest to him, he couldn't sell. The one thing that he could sell paid almost nothing. And his only way out was with the kind of writing that he he couldn't write no matter how hard he tried. And so it was so frustrating that you'll see throughout these journals notes like this. Painful stuff. So when you read his books, or when you look at pictures like this famous Alfred Eisenstadt photo of him taken in 1961, <laughs> it's easy to look at him and read his words and think, this boy, this just came so easily to him. He's got it all together. What you don't see is that those lines crossing his face and the bags under his eyes, it's not just from being out in the sun a lot, it's from much darker experience as well. Agony, suffering for many, many years, decades in fact, and the struggle of a person who never gave up. This isn't him. <laughs> 1985, that's me. I've been writing and talking about Sig for a long time. In fact, I had already been writing about him for three years by this point. I wrote my master's thesis on him in 1982, 83. That little girl there, next year she'll be 40. I hope she's not listening. <laughs> uh, that's how long I've been writing and talking about SIG. And it has been a huge blessing. And I've gotten to know the whole family. And there are so many connections over these years. So when I got this first copy, when it arrived at my house, two or three weeks ago, uh, and I'm flipping through it, so many emotions came through me. It's a deeply personal book for Sig and for his whole family, for sure. It's also really deeply personal for me, and I think I didn't fully recognize that until I flipped through the actual copy for the first time. So, Mr. Wood, I... Uh, can well, no one <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for a discussion. Well, that's nice because I'm ready to have one too. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is an uh, evening I've been looking forward to a lot, and I think David has been as well. Absolutely. As, unfortunately, David, you've already run through the answers to all my questions pretty much. <laughs> But I'm probably going to go ahead and ask them anyway, and, and I figure you may be able to go into a little more, more depth. But first of all, I was going to tell folks, tell our, our listeners that you and I have been friends for a very long time. And the main reason for that friendship and for our connection at all is our shared interest in and, and respect for and really love for this man named Sigurd F. Olson. Uh, David and I both, both wrote to him at about the same age seeking advice in our lives and he was very generous as David knows with many people and people who would who would ask his advice and come to him for guidance over the years and David and I were two of those people 
And so we've had this long friendship very much with Sigurd Olson kind of at the center of it. So I just want to congratulate you, David, on a, on a beautiful book. I don't know. Did you hold it up? We should hold it up. Private Wilderness. You can see I've got it bookmarked there for particular spots. He faced this book. <laughs> and, and it's very similar in title to the biography, um, A Wilderness Within, A Private Wilderness. But the first question I want to ask you, David, is you have been studying SIG, reading SIG, uh, meeting with SIG, meeting with Bob and Vani all these years, but you started as I did with, uh, with reading his books. And, and, and as you went through your journey, I know that you have said that you had really been wanting to write this book, this book based on the journals for a long time. And yeah. I was wondering if you could tell us why that was, what the impetus and the special interest in doing this particular book based on SIG's journals. Well, initially, like everyone else, I, I knew SIG as the icon, that man in the Eisenstadt photo and the writer of the books who seemed to have it all together. Uh, as I did my master's thesis, which was a history of his uh, role in getting in getting airplanes banned from the Boundary Waters, I saw a few of his scattered journal entries in his papers at the Minnesota History Center in St. Paul. And I began to realize there's, there's much more to this guy. And uh, I saw more of that stuff as I worked on my dissertation, which was the history of the Boundary Waters. And uh, I, I came to understand that Sigurd Olson was worthy of a biography, yes, already because of what he's famous for, his, his nature writing. He won the highest award in nature writing. Uh, and for his uh, environmental work, he won the highest honors for the major conservation groups in America. All of that made him worthy of a biography, but that wasn't why I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it because I saw by then the struggle he had gone through. And this is something that uh, was important to me personally as somebody who was going through a similar struggle to figure out who, who I'm supposed to be. And uh, it, to me to read those journals led to such hope because uh, it, it's a message of, you, you see somebody at the pinnacle of their career you have to realize that if they have a calling to get there, a calling always comes with a lot of suffering. And, and Sigurd went through it. And sometimes he came close to giving up and it was just the right person at just the right time who helped him not give up. All of that is really important. And when I became a professor, I began to see this in my students as well. How, how many were following the path they were following because it was practical, for example, or they felt this is what their parents would approve, et cetera. Well, the more I got into this, uh, the more I used Sigurd as an example with my students, especially in my nature and culture course, uh, I would constantly bring them up as an example of the importance of figuring out who you are what are your gifts? What do you feel passionate about? What might you be called to do? The world is full of people who live according to the expectations of others. Uh, the world needs people to be themselves uh, because that's when you'll make the most important difference. Whether it's a small one or big, it won't matter because it will be the one that only you could make. Sig used to say to me when I would talk to him, uh, wondering about how I could ever become a writer when it seems like everything's already been said. He said, you see things different than anyone else. Just write them the way you see them and it will be different then. And there's a real truth to that. And, and uh, it applies not just to writing, uh, it's to life in general. Each of us has something unique to give and will be most fulfilled if we can find a way to make that come out. And, and so the biography and the journals together, I think can really inspire people who might be going through that struggle or need that sense of inspiration. The biography is my best interpretation of the character of this man 
the journals is his own at the moment self-interpretation of what he's going through. And I, I see them as real companions. And that notion of character is so, so important. When I wrote the biography, my, the line that I had uh, taped up where I was writing was from another biographer who uh, quoted Vince Lombardi. And I think it's not actually a real quote. Uh, Vince Lombardi supposedly said, uh, winning isn't, uh, isn't everything, it's the only thing. And I guess he didn't really say that. But in any case, in biography, character isn't everything, it's the only thing. And that really guided me as I approached that book. And I knew this would be a perfect companion to it. It just, the Olson family was, they loved the biography, uh, but they were also ready for a breather. At that point, there was so much uh, personal airing of things, you know, they were ready for things to be quiet for a while. And, and so uh, Bob and Bonnie kept the journals at their house for a while. And then when they donated them to the Wisconsin Historical Society, they, they said, let's keep them uh, out of researchers' hands for 10 years. So I had actually forgotten about it. I had thought that uh, uh, it was probably not gonna happen during my time of, but then in 2018, I got a call from uh, the state archivist, Matt Blessing, and he said that uh, uh, the, the papers were now open. He had talked to Bob about them, and Bob said, Let, let's do it. And uh, actually, the actual words were, it's time. And, and he said, uh, you know, I th you're the first person I thought of. Is this something you'd be interested in doing a book on? And I said, are you kidding? So I... I dropped everything that I was doing in order to do this. So you really see them as companions, one to, to another. The biography, yeah. your, your interpretation, and, and the, uh, the new book, The Private Wilderness, being Sig's interpretation of himself at the time that he lived it. I think people can benefit. Of course, as a writer, I should say this by reading both of my books, but, <laughs> but I think there's real truth to that. I, it, in my biography, yes, I quote from the journals of Fairmont. These, especially those first seven years, they were so important to bring out the character of this person. Uh, but I, it's one thing to read occasional excerpts from them and my putting everything into context, but it's another to see entry after entry after entry of, of his own self-analysis. And it could be pretty brutal at times. And I think it's important to see that part of it as well. Let me let me jump on a word that you used a few minutes ago, because it's a very important word in your interpretation of Sig, and I think in his own interpretation of himself. And that word is a calling, C A L L I N G. You use that word in in the book, talking about Sigurd's the feeling that he had a calling, yes, to, to do this, to 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 express himself in a special way. And the quote that jumps out at me, in fact, Sigurd himself, if I'm reading your book right, typed it in, in all caps in his journal. And the exact, and make sure I get the words right, the exact words he used were, I want to write more beautifully than anyone ever has about nature. And then he repeated it two lines later, all caps, and followed it up by saying, if I do this, I will have fulfilled my life and my purpose. Something like that. I'm not yeah. sure I got those words right. Anyway, that is a very big ambition. And it's also a very explicit stating at the age of 30, 29, 30, 31, of a life's goal and a, and a, and a calling because it's so powerful that it can't just be referred to as a goal or a hope or a wish. So my question mm -hmm. to you, David, is... What are the rewards, and perhaps more important, what are the costs of having such a calling in one's life? When you pursue a direction in life that feels like more than just, this is going to be a, a career I can like, I can enjoy, when it becomes something that you feel I I'm meant to do this and I have to do this. Uh, it, it, I think inevitably is going to lead to real suffering uh, because 
any real calling is probably going to be something kind of on the big side. Uh, and, and so there's going to be struggle over how to achieve that. And if you have a family, it's, this, it's going to bump up against the realities of family life and other relationships too, probably. So there's that part of it. But also there will be those moments and, you know, for sick during these early years, those moments were maybe few and scattered, but it still would hit him where he describes something, maybe it's a paragraph and it feels so good, so right. Or he'll write an essay and he'll have Elizabeth read it. Uh, he'll have a neighbor read it and he'll write in his journals how they were moved to tears and he knows that he's got something. And then sometimes he writes it directly like uh, uh, I've got one I can find for you here. He, sometimes he, he can come across even as arrogant, I suppose, but hard to know how, how to take this. I am a harp on whose sensitive strings the winds of the world blow, and my task is to set to music the strains I alone can hear. I must give ear forever to celestial music. And, and so, uh, and later on, uh, another one where he says, I feel that I have a message, something to contribute, something that many people are missing. He felt the connectedness in nature uh, that he experienced every time he was out there as something that was uh, falling by the wayside in American life, that people were becoming more and more detached and that uh, a lot of, uh, of the suffering in life that people went through was because they weren't close enough to nature. Uh, so that was his calling. It was a spiritual calling at heart. And of course, his father was a uh, was a minister, preacher. Right. His and father I, was a, you went in your biography into some detail about Sig's struggle yeah. with his own religious beliefs, and, and yeah. so this calling that he felt although different from his father's, was similar in nature almost as, as an evangelist for the wilderness. Yes, and uh, it's, there's lots of interesting subtext in that as well. His father was a fundamentalist Swedish Baptist minister, uh, and that was hard for Sig and his two brothers to deal with oftentimes. Sig was the middle child, uh, so his brother felt more pressure in some ways than Sig did. Uh, but you could see it uh, later in life where Stigard said, I probably saved more souls than my father did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good quote. <laughs> Let me go in a different direction here in our, in our talk. So um, in the, the books, like 320 pages long, there's a lot of great writing in it. You're writing course is wonderful but in Sig's journals there's some good writing in there even though he was writing personally for himself what I'm sort of wondering is um these journals covered am I right thinking 1930 to 1947 31 to 47 something like that yeah and the bulk of it is 1930 to 41 and it tapers off for several years and then there's a whole bunch in 1946 47 which is a really bad year for him so my question is then later on when he is a successful writer and he has offers from Alfred A. Knopf to publish his, his book and eventually more more books. Did you find that he was able to go back into this time of the personal journals and and mine them for ideas and themes? People like you and me and other readers of Sig Olson are, are familiar with these towering themes that appear again and again in his books like like headlands or or outcroppings or promontories in the canoe country there's for one is the spiritual connection that we human beings have to the natural world another is something i think he called racial memory where we have a subconscious understanding of our of our having evolved from the world of nature and still being a part of it He's got a long-standing interest in, in the canoe as a vehicle and, and a work of art and a, and a means of transportation in the wilderness. And of course, the canoe country and, and the voyageurs. So do these themes appear in his journals or are the journals more concerned with his own private struggles? The journals 
are mostly, um, almost entirely, but, uh, not quite entirely concerned with his own struggles um, and hopes, not just struggles, but uh, what he'd like to do. And, and so there was a point, uh, it might've been in the late forties or it might've been as he was starting to put together the essays that became the singing wilderness. There was a point where he's uh, thinking about mining his old journals and he, and he talks about it. Then he says, uh, there really wasn't anything there because he said it was pretty much all about his own self-centered search for who he was, you know, and his, his medium, as he put it. So as a, as a reader of Sig's books first and foremost, and then later his biographer, uh, did you find yourself wading through these journals and going, come on, Sig, come on, come on. You're, you're circling back over and over again. You're going over the same, uh -huh. the same problems. Did that happen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so when I did the research for the biography, I was in my early 30s, like he was when he gets his journal underway. And as I read those, there were so many times I was frustrated with him. Uh, I, because you, as an outsider, you know, you could see that he's just, he's not making a decision. And, and when he does, he's doing the wrong thing, is not going to make him happy. And he, yet he keeps saying the same. Uh, complaints and he won't take the steps necessary to reduce that and it was beyond frustrating at times for me as a young man. Uh, and, yet, and yet we have the benefit of hindsight because we know how the story is going to turn yeah, out. We yeah. know it's going to get published. We know he's going to become a national icon. We know he's going to win all these awards. He didn't know any of that. To him, no. complete failure was a very real possibility. And that, to me, that's one of the inspiring things about this. It sounds a little bit dark as we discuss these um, difficulties that he was going through, but it's very inspiring to hear him work through it all with no guarantee that it's all yeah. going to work out. And many writers, many writers, perhaps the majority of writers, go through similar doubts and struggles. Absolutely. Don't, and don't come through. And so when I wrote the biography, I had, I had, uh, accepted all of that and was no longer frustrated with him and understood why he had to go through it. What was interesting to me with this book is I hadn't looked at those journal entries in almost 30 years. And so now instead of reading them in my early 30s, I'm reading them in my early 60s. And uh, I was much more patient. <laughs> uh, having gone through more struggles myself, I, I, I didn't feel the need to yell at him that I did when I was <laughs> 31. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> now, let me ask you about Sig the teacher, because in my understanding of him, and I never had him as a teacher or in a class, but I have met people who did, and almost to a person, they talk about what a wonderful teacher he was, how much they enjoyed his classes. They were surprised to learn that he didn't really love teaching. Yeah because their experience of him was as a marvelous teacher who seemed to be very well connected with his students and loved the subjects he was teaching. Everything that I found when I researched the biography supports that conclusion. I talked to a number of former students of his and uh, also from reading other things that were written at the time by him or by other people. It, it, he, and sometimes he admitted it himself. He knew he was good at being a teacher. I guess the real question was, could he convince himself to like it enough to let go of his need to write? And he would keep, and he would say, no, I, he had to write. And, and he got in the way of it. That's a theme you come back to very often expressed in different ways that he had a terrible urge to write, a terrible need yeah. to write. He had to write to maintain his sanity. These are things he said yeah. about, about himself. I'm sort of wondering in your, in your research and, and in your understanding of Sig, the essence of this need. Was it essentially a great need for self-expression? What was part of it a need for recognition? Uh, was there a kind of a blending of the two? What's your thought on that? 
those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, he had a powerful need for self-expression and he definitely, and you can see this in the journals, he, he had a need for recognition as well. How much of a need, uh, you know, is open to speculation, I suppose. But part of it is his older brother, Kenneth, uh, was always doing these prominent things. And Sigurd was lagging behind, you know. Uh, Sigurd becomes Dean of Ely Junior College. Kenneth becomes Dean of Northwestern University's school, Medill School of Journalism, you know. And, so he was always like a step ahead of Sigurd. In fact, uh, I think even Kenneth might have seen some competition in there because uh, late in life, he finally said, well, Sigurd, I guess you're the most famous of us. I remember that. I remember that yeah. well from your biography. Yeah. Well, those family dynamics are powerful. And yeah. not, only between, not only between Kenneth and Sigurd, but between Sigurd's father and Sigurd and his father's expectations. And, and yeah. those are very powerful things. So as, at the same time that he's working through his place in the broad world, he's also trying to work through his place in the family, in the family of origin and, and in yeah. how, he, how he fits. Some of that is a, a religious and spiritual struggle. Uh, his father believed in three acceptable occupations, um, ministry, of course, uh, teaching or farming and SIG, initially thought he was going to go into agriculture and that's why he ended up at UW-Madison for his final two years as an undergrad because he was majoring in agriculture. Um, while he was there he got involved with this missionary group called Student Volunteers. They were the leading arm of Protestant evangelization at that time period and uh, he suddenly felt a fire that he he wanted to be a missionary and go to these wild places of the earth uh, to be a missionary in those places. Well, he became popular pretty quickly and got elected president of this organization. And, and the night that he was, the night before he was going to publicly declare himself uh, to commit himself to the missionary as well as accept the presidency, he had grave second thoughts and he climbed up to the top of the YMCA building which is now a parking lot but it's just is between uh, the Red Gym and uh, Memorial Union at, at UW-Madison and he, he climbed up to the roof and he looked out over Lake Mendota and the stars overhead and he fought it out and when he came down in the morning he resigned and I have always wondered how that went over at home because what it really it was a break with his religion as well as with his plans. Uh, and and he, one of his first journal entries in 1930 is about that period. And so he, it was, it was his first entry in which he describes himself as being suicidal. Uh, he had lost all sense of direction and it took him ages to even begin to get a glimmer as to where he should go with his life at that point. Uh, so it was hard, it was hard for him. I'm sure it was hard for his parents. Uh, so that's definitely another aspect of this, not just the competition, but this having been brought in this highly religious atmosphere as somebody who had a deep innate spirituality, but it wasn't ultimately in the same direction. I think that's the source of a lot of the inspiration for readers here in this book is that they, yes. some the readers will be able to find themselves within these pages uh, because any serious person sensitive serious person has doubts about who they are what yeah. they believe how to fulfill their their destiny um what how they fit into the world um all of that the one of the interesting things about Sigurd is that while he wrestled with all these normal human doubts he kept being perceived as far as I can tell as having it much more together than perhaps he did. You just said he was he was already elected president of this organization that the next yeah. morning he decided he had to quit. Right. So there was something about his figure and it, it was a powerful figure all the way into his 80s until he died yeah. at age 82 that people perceived 
this strange power that he had, even though internally he was wrestling with many a doubt, he was a charismatic person and, and a person who cut quite a figure in life. Would you say that's true? That's absolutely true. Uh, there's lots of examples from that later in life as well. Um, for example, uh, 60 years ago, last month, in May of 1961, Hubert Humphrey wrote to Sigurd saying that uh, he knew that the new interior secretary, Stuart Udall, was considering SIG for director of the National Park Service. Well, and Udall came on board and uh, one of his, one of the people he trusted was the novelist Wallace Stegner. And he asked Stegner uh, to join the advisory board, uh, maybe initially just to attend a meeting. He, he wanted to get some insight onto the members of the board. And so Stegner, uh, went and w observed all of these people at the advisory board meeting. When he, he wrote about Sigurd, he said, Sigurd Olson doesn't say much, but when he talks, people listen, and with good reason. So that may be why uh, you'd always interested in having Sig as National Park Service director, but oh, thank goodness that never ended up happening because Sigurd would have hated himself if he had said yes to it. Oh, I know from your writings how often he would resent being, literally resent being in a meeting in Washington, D.C., lobbying, uh, fighting for important issues, and yet losing time from his calling. Yeah. And part of expressing himself. Where this connects to his family again is he, ha he had a powerful sense, he and his brothers, from their parents, a powerful sense of duty. Yes. And I think a lot of his conservation work can be explained in part through that sense of duty, even though he felt he needed to be writing, he also knew he was on the scene and in position at a moment in time when there was a chance to add all kinds of wonderful wild lands to our protected systems of various sorts. And uh, he, how could he say no to that? So it, it was a duty. And it's not that he entirely hated it, but there were times when he really resented not having the time to write. He once told Bob, because Bob asked him, he said, how, where do you find it time to write? He says, in hotel rooms and airplanes. And so it wasn't just at the writing shack in those days. But right. that's where he wanted to be. Yeah. That sense of duty, I think, um led him to, to be the, the figure that he was in preservation of wilderness areas, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Voyagers National Park, but places as far flung as Alaska and, and uh, Point Reyes National Seashore and all over the continent. Right. But it also led him, I think, to respond to a letter from a 21-year-old, 23-year-old young man trying to find their way through life. And he had a million other things to do. And yeah. Yet, famous for sending the letters like he sent to you and me with I got mine within three or four days of sending my letter out to him. Yeah, I know I got mine within six days and from Madison to Ely and back. And I didn't even have a street address. I just said Sigurd Olson to Ely, Minnesota, you know, and uh, to get a letter back six days later at a time when I felt like dropping out of college. I, I, it was huge, wasn't it? It meant everything in the world to me at that point. It wasn't even so much what he said, which is, you know, basically stay in school, but uh, <laughs> it was the fact that he cared enough to write. And I had no idea at that time how busy he was. Hi, Maya. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to pop back on. I saw that we're getting sort of towards the end of the hour here. And I know that there are a bunch of questions that folks have been asking. Um, also wanted to remind people, if you do have questions you've been sitting on, to put them in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen, um, and we can try to get to those. Um, I wanted to bring up one that Kevin had asked, who says, love the book, David. Lots of agony and angst from 1930 to 1947. Um, do you think that the act of journaling may have been, at least in some part, a therapeutic exercise for SIG? where he could verbalize his anxieties and maybe blow off a little steam. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. He had nobody he could talk to about this. Nobody understood him. It, one of the th things that struck me as I did the biography was uh, I, 
I grew to know him better than his family did in many ways. They all said that to me. In fact, Elizabeth, one of her very last interviews that we did before I started writing was, you know, I never really knew Sig. He, he, he kept this kind of stuff inside him. And so it had to come out somewhere and he, he wrote it in his journals. And so you have to realize, uh, you know, I see this book as a real sign of hope for anybody who has a dream or a sense of calling, passion for anything, even though there's lots of very dark entries in it, it's because he's working through all of that and the fact that he ultimately made it and, and uh, uh, he's admitting how, how much he's struggling. And uh, he didn't write, occasionally he wrote journal entries when he was feeling really great, but usually, it, and this is how a lot of people when they write uh, diaries or journals, they, uh, they write when they're feeling down. That's how it naturally comes to many people. Maybe there's some people who are just the opposite, but that's certainly how it was for Sig. So remember that too, as you read it, if it seems like it, there's more negativity from him than you would anticipate. Remember this is, he's writing usually when he's not feeling fulfilled about something. And sometimes it's really hard. Good point. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, to get to just a comment that I wanted to bring up, someone is saying, Karen mentioned, if Sig were alive today, I believe he'd continue typing out his drafts on his Royal typewriter. Um, <laughs> wanted to just bring that to light. Um, there were a few people kind of in the comments as well as in the Q&A asking why the journals were given to Wisconsin Historical Society and not to Minnesota. As Bob told it to me, the, they thought, now if, if Sig and Elizabeth had donated them while they were alive, maybe they would have all gone to Minnesota, I don't know. But Bob had a reasonable thought to, to me anyways, and that was Wisconsin also has some of Sigurd Olson's legacy. And so why not have some of his stuff be in Wisconsin too? And that was really the, the, the only reason. That makes I a lot of sense. I heard David mention Parker J. Palmer earlier, and I thought I just saw a comment come up from Parker there. Did you read, could you find that? Oh one? yeah, let's see, Parker here says, Sigurd Olson was raised in a religious tradition heavy on guilt. Is there any evidence that some sort of guilt kept him locked into the work that was not soul satisfying to him for so long? Um, and did he ever journal about that? The only, I wouldn't be surprised, but the only time that he really journaled about feelings of guilt had more to do with feeling guilt that he couldn't be like a normal person in town. Yeah. Could be happy do, living a, a typical life. He would, he described himself as neurotic at best. He, he they, they'd go to someone's house for where several couples would be gathered together to play cards and Sig would sit in the corner reading a book. He, he just, he couldn't fit in and that was really hard. And it got to the point where surprisingly because the outdoors were so much a part of him, uh, he carried this writing stuff with him so that he, he even found it hard at times to enjoy going out on uh, fishing and hunting trips with his friends or even his sons. And he wished and he expressed some guilt that he couldn't feel the sheer pleasure that they were feeling. Instead, he was thinking about how can he turn this into writing? Let me, let me ask you something, David, because we've been so focused on these years of 1930 to 1943 and then 1947, where he did often journal uh, things that were problems and issues. What did it mean to Sig to fin finally arrive, quote unquote, to, to find some success, to, to find the acceptance he found from the national conservation organizations and then to finally get published at, at that late, I believe he was 57 years old when he first got- When Sig and Williams came out and it made the New York Times bestseller list. And from then on, he, <laughs> he, he was there. Uh, 
there was a huge sense of fulfillment. But even before that, he had some fulfillment because uh, he, he resigns from Ely Junior College in, in April of 1947. Uh, it, well, it took effect at the end of that school year. And, and he goes through a scary summer and fall where he's trying to write and he can't get anything sold. <laughs> and he's thinking that he made a terrible mistake. He's got no income coming in. And that's when uh, he was approached by uh, people of the group called the Quetico Superior Council to spearhead the fight to ban airplanes from the boundary waters. That, and he did that. And it, it was a natural for him, um, but the money also was something that he really needed at that point too. So it was both, and it was kind of a perfect timing. He took that and he's traveling around, uh, not only the United States, but into Canada, Ottawa, Ontario, and you know, visiting with federal officials for the Quetico up there. And um, he's, finding a kind of recognition that we're the, one of the things that he wanted, uh, he, he was getting that and he's having interesting conversations, he's meeting interesting people. And uh, he, he was finding some of that fulfillment that he had long wanted for. So even by 1950, 1949, 50, he's starting to feel quite a bit better about life. There was just that one missing thing at that point and that was a book. And then when that happens, uh, that's when he becomes that icon really that everyone thinks happened so easily, you know? And I think I think you should tell the brief story of how it was he actually finally got published. Well, by not. Yes, and this is another lesson of perseverance and that sometimes a little luck is helpful as well. It was because he was a conservationist working uh, on the canoe country stuff with the airplane fight that other uh, national conservation organizations got to know him and seek him. And so he became in 1953, the president of the National Parks Association. And as leader of that organization, he got involved in the major conservation fight of the 1950s, which was a battle to preserve the wild character of Dinosaur National Monument at the time, uh, which they had threatened to flood over with a water power project. And uh, that fight uh, really, it ended up being successful. It took a few years and uh, paved the way for the introduction of the bill to create a national wilderness preservation system. But SIG was one of the major conservation group leaders at that point. And so as that, he gave a speech in New York City in uh, the fall of 1954, I believe, yeah, uh, about the spiritual values of the national parks, such as this, and he comes home. He had spent the summer marketing this book. He had an agent. And uh, she had tried several places. He got home and there was yet a third rejection letter for uh, what became the Singing Wilderness. And this was the most painful one because it was from Paul Brooks, who was a personal friend of his and working for Houghton Mifflin. And he said, essays have to be superbly written to have a chance. And we'd all be disappointed if we tried to publish this. And then he opened up one more letter and it was from a man who had attended his talk in New York City. And he said he really enjoyed this talk about the spiritual values of the national parks. And he said, I wonder if someday you might not have a book for us. He signed his name, Alfred A. Knopf, and <laughs> only the world's most prestigious publisher. And so Sigurd wrote, he included the letter uh, from Knopf in his own note to uh, his agent saying maybe Knopf in a moment of weakness will take a gambling chance with this. And that's exactly how he's put it. And that's kind of how Knapp saw it too. He said, I don't know what kind of, how this book will do, but I want to take a chance. That, that's all it took, but think about it. So his conservation work gave him the, the break he needed to, be, to reach that final piece that he had longed for his whole life to become that published author who touched people's hearts about the spiritual connections we have with nature. And, uh, and yet that conservation work ultimately became a barrier to writing more of these books. He probably lost at least 
two books that he would have written had he given up on that conservation work early. David, David and I talked with Maya about, about lingering a little longer. Maybe Maya, you wanna tell the folks what, what, what might be able to happen here. Sure, so um, yeah, we are hitting eight o'clock and I know that um, if anyone needs to leave, please feel, feel free to do so. I um, wanted to just bring to your attention, I just put in the chat again, that link to order the book. Um, there's that 40% off code for the private wilderness as well as a few other titles in there. Um, also a link to support the work that Friends of the Boundary Waters is doing to continue you know, protecting this beautiful wild place. Um, so we've got a kind of a, a link to how you can support us there. Also wanted to note that I will be sending out a follow-up email um, either later on tomorrow or else early next week um, that will have these links as well and a recording of tonight's session. So again, if um, anyone has to leave, you know, you're welcome to do so. But I think I see a lot of really great questions in the chat. I know you all have, you know, so much knowledge of this topic and um, lots more to talk about. So I think We'll just keep on going um, and it'll be great to, to hear more from you. I think maybe this would be a good point as well to read some of the questions that have come in in the last couple minutes here. Um, an interesting one from Peter who says, I met SIG in the Twin Cities during the brouhaha over the Boundary Waters legislation when SIG was hung in effigy in Ely and how did that affect him? You know, I don't think it bothered him. <laughs> I really don't. Uh, one of the interesting things I discovered when uh, I researched that period of his life was that the, the people who were really antagonistic towards him in the late 70s, as you get this push to create a capital W wilderness area uh, with the Boundary Waters, well, they weren't people who knew Sig personally. And so I think that made it a little bit easier for him not to get, get all excited about it. Um, he, in fact, he, he joked about it saying that the effigy didn't look like him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, earlier, the people who opposed him in Ely, uh, sometimes it would seem more personal. You know, when, when, when people cross the street to avoid talking to you, that kind of thing can be sort of hard. It bothered Elizabeth a lot more than it did Sig. And uh, I think Sig rolled with the punches pretty well most of the time, but I'm sure sometimes sometimes it hurt. But some of those old timers who opposed him in those earlier decades, they could even admire him for uh, the, the, the quality of person he was and his uh, just the way he carried himself and his the work he did on behalf of the wilderness, even when they opposed him, many of them respected him. In fact, the mayor of Ely, uh, Jack Grahak, even created a Sigurd Olson day in the early 70s at some point. And, and he was someone who had been strongly opposed to Sigurd. So, so it changed between those early 70s and then the later 70s. And, and Sig wasn't super involved in those fights by that point. He was an old man and he was more of the sort of the symbolic lightning rod, I think, to be used by people. Uh, so it was harder on Elizabeth though. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, I see a question here from Robert who is wondering, um, Robert says, it took around 30 years from the time Sig declared his burning desire to be a writer um, before getting his first book published. When did this example of the extreme stick to it occur to you and did it surprise you? When did this example of his dreams? Uh, his extreme stick oh. to it, you know, his oh. this perseverance that he had even in the 30 years of, of not getting published. It was clear, you know, just early early in his journals, you see how intense he feels about what he's supposed to do, that he has to, he has not only a calling, but a need to write. And so the perseverance, I guess, uh, once I saw those journal entries, that didn't surprise me. What was uh, maybe a little bit more surprising is at times, he was hanging by a thread and it seemed always at that moment, just the right person came to give him some hope. 
Uh, and everybody needs that, you know, so it's another lesson for, it was a great lesson for me as a professor in dealing with my students uh, to help them try to figure this sort of stuff out in their own life and and separate the expectations of others from who they truly are and not give up so easily. And some of them to this day will still get in touch with me at times when they need a little bit of boost of uh, inspiration or hope because they struggle. Some of them have taken very hard, creative careers where you're barely scraping by financially oftentimes. It's very fulfilling, but it's very hard. Maybe that's one of the reasons he was so good about being a responder and, and giving young people like you and me and others hope was because there had been people there just at the moments that he needed that in his life. Yes, I'm, absolutely. Uh, that's what made him the way he was, I think. And, uh, and him being that for me, as well as seeing the examples from his life, helped me to become that kind of a person as well. So uh, I <laughs> there's so much gratitude that I have for him and Elizabeth and the whole family. And uh, my life is so much better because of them. You know, I happen to write these books and I'm glad that they've done well and that they've helped more people understand who he really was and uh, be inspired by him now because we need that inspiration and I think his philosophy now more than ever. Totally. Um, maybe I'll do one more question right now from the folks in the audience and then Doug I know you have some more things that you're sitting on over there. Um, the next one I guess that I'll read out is from Judd who's wondering can either of you shed some light on SIG's friendship with Jim Brandenburg? who was also a champion of preserving the Boundary Waters. David? I actually really don't know much about that. Uh, I did, not enough to give any specifics anyways. I mean, Sig knew so many people, writers, photographers, uh, artists, musicians, uh, or all of them when, when they're combined in Doug Wood. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, so I guess I don't know too many personal anecdotes about uh, many of those people that you know, just know that they knew each other and were friends and uh, they probably have to tell you a story like that themselves. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have any special insight to share on that either, but I would like to jump back because there's a name that's been popping up for the last hour over and over again, but we haven't stopped and talked about that person really. And that's Elizabeth Olson. Oh, thank you. Yeah. While all of these struggles were going on in Sig's heart and his mind and within his family obligations and his career and his doubts about himself, how did all of this impact Elizabeth and what was her role in helping Sig through all of it? Her role was essential. I don't know if he knew that for a long time, uh, but it was. It was so hard for her. She came from a very different kind of family. Uh, Soren Earnholt, prosperous farmer in the cutover region of Wisconsin near Hayward and, 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 and uh, ahead of his time conservationist and an artist in his own way and, uh, and very social, unlike her husband. And so she was used to having people coming over to the house and celebrating things and, and sick wasn't that way. I, th that was hard at times. And some of the aspects of his personality were not hard for her. Even some that might seem that people today might expect were hard. Like for example, it really didn't bother her or the, the boys for that matter that he spent a lot of time away from home outdoors. There were a lot of dads, for one thing, in the Ely area that did that kind of thing. Sig maybe did it a little bit more excessively, but uh, it was good stuff. And then he'd be bringing home 
uh, you know, fish and, and game and, and they'd eat it and then they have their own participation with camping and stuff. So that kind of stuff, as far as I could tell, never bothered Elizabeth. She told me it, uh, it never did. And I believe that she joked about their first year of marriage. There was one time when she was hurt. Uh, it was her birthday. So November 13th, that would have been of 1921. And uh, they were living in Nashwalk, Minnesota and uh, Sig was out hunting. He didn't get home in time for dinner for her birthday. She was upset until he finally arrived home and told her why he didn't make it in time. It was because he had wounded a deer and he couldn't bear to leave it. He had to track it down. And so she forgave him. There was a woman who lived uh, next door who said to her one day, you have to tame that seg. Uh, well, she, she couldn't and she didn't really want to. The hard thing was his obsession with writing and that ties to that inner sig that he pretty much bottled up and she didn't have an adequate sense of that, I think. And she knew how much it meant to him by the way he reacted to things. And so early on, you'll see where she, in 1930, uh, offers to divorce him if it'll help make him happier, to free him. And his response is a little bit shocking, I think. He says he, he chuckled and uh, kind of brushed it off, seemingly. But she... I think it, in this time and place, maybe she would have divorced him, but she stuck with it. And there were times it was hard. She would goad him at times. She would tell him, you'll see it in his journals. He'll quote her, uh, uh, you have no power of decision, she would say. Uh, or, or, you know, he'd have her read his writings and critique it. And sometimes he'd get angry. And so there there were many challenges along the way and she stuck to it and uh, enjoyed the good times and managed through those hard times. She uh, loved it once he finally was happy and became that author because one of the things that came with uh, being Elizabeth Olson, Mrs. Sigurd F. Olson at that point was you had people like Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas coming to their house, Hubert Humphrey. And so all these interesting people who she could be more like her own family's history with and bringing out food and drink and, and uh, being the hostess, which she loved. When I got to know her, of course, she was elderly. And uh, by the time she was ready to allow someone to do the biography, she was already 93 years old by then and finally ready to let go of the difficult personal things uh, and let me write it. She said, I know you're going to have to say things that I won't like to see, but I wanted to do it. Uh, I'm still kind of glad that she didn't live long enough to read it. It would have been hard for her. Mm. I think she would have approved it, but it wouldn't have been easy. But it did. it is interesting that she, the last, um... 30 years or so of her life, she did get to return to that person that she was early in life, a person who was social and who had interesting things going on in the home and people dropping by and, and events and parties and and plus the recognition that, that came with it that must have been gratifying. That's a special person. I, I can't say enough about her. In fact, uh, she has a cameo in my first novel. <laughs> <laughs> the one I was talking about earlier, uh, listening points, I was going to reflect back and refer to meeting Elizabeth Olson uh, in the, the uh, 1990s in, uh, at the Chocolate Moose. And it's just like Elizabeth was at that time. So I, I would sometimes see her at the Moose if I wasn't meeting her at the home. And, and there would be people there gathered around it. And often enough, it would be young women who would gather around her because she was amazing. And they would take inspiration and hope from her. And I kept, I kept, 
Pardon? She, she'd been through the wars. Yes, she, she'd been through the wars. She had great advice for people. Uh, she was very practical. Uh, and as everyone of middle-aged or older who I interviewed about her always said, she was a real lady. <laughs> You got any more hot questions for us there, Maya? Sure. Um, and just a comment to start off with someone, Betty in the, in the question says, a bit of trivia, Elizabeth had a recipe for awesome sugar cookies. Yes, she did. And they're, so still, made, they're still made and still served at uh, Sigurd Olson, Sigurd and Elizabeth's old house in Ely, which is now the world headquarters of the Listening Point Foundation. So if you go there to visit, you will probably be served some of Elizabeth's genuine recipe sugar cookies, just as he would have been 30 years ago. That's and wonderful. Yeah, would recommend a visit wow. to that place. Um, I want to get back to a question from Mark, who is asking if you could please explain Sig's connection to Northland College and how did he find that school? It's a long, uh, a long family connection. Uh, Sig's dad was assigned to Ashland in, oh, I think around 1912, 1913. And so Sig spent his teenage years in Ashland. And Northland at that time was more closely uh, affiliated with uh, a, a religious denomination at that point. And I, it's, I'm forgetting which one it was, frankly. but. Um, more closely tied to that than it would be seen today. And uh, so it wasn't surprising then that Sig's older brother Kenneth went there and then Sig went there. And Sig, once again, had to follow his famous older brother who was like the perfect person on campus doing all these things. And uh, Elizabeth's first story to me about meeting him is hilarious. It was at Kenneth's graduation from Northland College and uh, she was attending with her family, the Ehrenhold family. And so if Kenneth, uh, uh, Sig was, I think about 16-ish and uh, she's going down the aisle to find a place to, to sit. And she said, she described it to me, something like this. I saw this, this kid all scrunched down in his seat with his legs sticking out in the aisle. And I thought, who is that? <laughs> Well, it was the younger brother of the famous Kenneth Olson. Uh, she would have been shocked if somebody had told her that day that she would marry him. Yeah. So th there's a strong family connection. And then Bob Olson uh, uh, went to Northland. I don't think Sig Jr. did, but Bob has a connection there and Bob's wife, Bonnie. And uh, so it continued. And, and so Sig had a fond place in his heart for Northland College. And so when they asked him in 1972 to uh, lend his name to the Environmental Institute that they were creating, uh, well, they had to pressure him pretty hard, but it, he had enough of a connection that it was conceivable for them to be able to do it. Sure. Thanks for that answer. Um, we got a bunch of kind of comments and other things that people are sharing here. Um, somebody, James mentioned in 1961, I paddled from Isle across down the Churchill River following Lake by Lake and Rapid by Rapid description by Sig. Um, uh -huh. Can't remember which of his books, but the descriptions were outstanding. So I wanted to just that to bring be, that comment up. That would be the book, The Lonely Land. Yeah. The Lonely I did the same thing in 1987 mm -hmm. and 1991. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Were the descriptions still good? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the descriptions were wonderful and poetically beautiful and accurate as to the nature of the country. Yeah. Using it for a guidebook for, for how to find the campsites and how to run the rapids, they were not all that accurate. And mm -hmm. which yeah. was a kind of a fun thing to find out. At that point, <laughs> I was a very young person and I idolized SIG and I expected, okay, the campsite's going to be right around this corner. It's going to be right. And it wasn't there. And <laughs> he began to realize, okay, he's writing 
poetry. He's writing. One of the surprising things about Sig is that even with his quote unquote autobiography, Open Horizons, uh, he he even wrote in his notes about that that he he saw himself. It's, it's not his life that he wanted to emphasize so much as a life he happened to have lived that others could relate to. And so he would put events out of sequence, anything that made the story work better for the themes he was developing. He wasn't trying to be perfectly accurate. It's the only autobiography I've ever read with no years listed. <laughs> and he said that in his intro, intro to The Lonely Land. He said, don't use this as a guidebook. It's not meant to be perfectly yeah. accurate. So yeah. Anyway, go good. ahead. Go ahead, Maya. Uh, I see Stephen here has some comments about um, he in 1976 went to visit Sig and Ely. Um, and Sigurd Olson was busy on that day and wasn't able to, to take that call, but um, ended up sending Stephen a letter and they had some communication after that and just wanted to mention that. He really appreciated like Sigurd's old Sigurd's um, effort to find him and correspond and offer suggestions. And I think that that kind of plays into some of both of your stories of you know feeling so appreciative of this person with so much knowledge and thoughtfulness reaching out to you and you know valuing that. Yeah, I was shocked when I did the biographical research on him and saw how even in 1976. Uh, at the age of 77, how busy he was. And yet he still in February 77 sent that letter to me right away. And I just thought that's amazing. It truly is amazing. Yeah, it really is. Um, I see Christopher just added a question here. The first book by Sigurd that I read was The Lonely Land. It seems to be a bit of a departure from the rest of his books since everything else is more just collections of short essays. Um, do you know why he didn't write about any other expansive journeys or experiences like that? He almost did. Uh, he was supposed to write a book. I think it was, I can't remember if it was for National Geographic. He, he was going to write a book on Northern rivers and talk about different expeditions he had on them. Uh, and he even got a, a big advance from them uh, for the book and after two years and he was behind on the deadline and he barely even started it. He, he had to say, I, I, he just didn't have the time for it. And so he stopped. So the, the closest thing you'll see to, to that is uh, some of the essays in Rooms of the North talk about some of these other expeditions, but uh, he never had followed through on uh, writing another whole one again. And that book, The Lonely Land, uh, it's even more famous in Canada than it is here. It, it played a major role in uh, in launching sort of the modern wilderness canoe tripping scene in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to jump in and, and mention that the men who accompanied Sig on that journey and his other Made, and he didn't start doing major northern rivers until very late in life, in his mid-50s. And, and those men became very close friends of Sig. He called them his voyageurs. And Elliot and Omond and Tony and, and the whole gang were huge admirers of Sig. They called him the bourgeois, their bourgeois of their trips. And after he, he passed away, they created a bronze plaque for, for Listening Point in his memory. They, they were all very accomplished men, highly respected and recognized men in various fields in, in Canada, but they still look to Sig as their, as their leader. And, and I think it's interesting, although he may not have had a lot of close friendships in those early struggling years, because he was so focused on his work, that in those later years, uh, that was a really tightly knit group that, that thought very highly of each other. Would you say so, David? Yes, they were a tight knit group. But, uh, they always stayed in close touch with each other. I got to interview three or four of them. Uh, a couple others had passed by that point, but uh, those were such fun interviews because they had so many wonderful stories to say, but it was clear just how fond they were of both Sig and Elizabeth. 
Wonderful. I see one last question here that I think is a really great way to kind of start closing this conversation. So maybe I'll pose that and then turn it over to you if you have any final thoughts from both of you. Um, but the question is, what do you think Sigurd's advice would be to those who are working today to conserve wild lands and waters? I'll jump in first because I want David to close with that. <laughs> but, um, his advice would be to not give up because he had many opportunities in his life to give up, to give up on himself, to give up on the world, to give up on preservation of wild lands, to give up when people hung him in effigy and called him terrible names and said he was a fool and said terrible things about him. And so no matter what, you just don't give up. And, and if things are not going, going your way this month or this year or this decade, I mean, he took a long view. He fought for decades to save the boundary waters, decades. So you, and I, and, and if there's a wonderful movie, a little half hour movie, uh, The Wilderness World of Sigurd Olsen, is that the name of it, David, I think? And, and it shows Sig at Listening Point and it shows Sig and Elizabeth in their home and they're being interviewed and they're just talking and having a conversation. And in one scene, Sig is out on, uh, on a, an island in Burnside Lake, just a mile from Listening Point, uh, Pine Island, I believe. And there are 300 year old white and red pines all around on these hummocks of moss and, and these rock outcrops. And Sig is walking along under these three century pines. And then he grabs a little, a little uh, seedling pine, maybe five feet tall by the top, by the top knot. And he said, this tree is you. You are the next generation. The whole world depends on you, just as it once depended on these big pines right here. I get a tear in my eye every time I watch that part wow. of the movie. And that's what he would say. Ex that's exactly what I was going to say, Doug. Uh, that scene in that movie, if you watch that, he's speaking directly to you. Uh, in fact, I love the way he introduces this thing. is so funny in his own way. Uh, he says, uh, there's a beautiful shot up this way, Gus, but here's the baby you want. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. Here's and that's the baby Gus, that little tree. Uh, and, but he's talking directly to the viewer. Yep, so he answered your question right yeah. there. Right there, that's the perfect thing. Watch that movie. And if you don't know about that movie, you don't have that movie. What is it? It's, it's uh, 40 years old now, maybe. Yeah. But you can still get it from the Listening Point Foundation, and it's well worth having. It's Half so hour long, and it's, it's just a wonderful little film. Yep. So are we. I'm seeing some folks asking for the link to that movie. So um, when I send the follow up email, I can, I can try to include that as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's a good way to wrap up I think David I, I actually went through all the big questions I wanted to ask and you gave really good in-depth answers thank you so much I hope that folks enjoyed it yeah wonderful I, yeah I've seen a lot of people in the in the chat and all really finding this like very um informational and they're very grateful for the discussion and to kind of get a more of a background understanding on somebody that you know we all care about and, and know a lot about um so really dig deeper into that understanding. Um, so I've really enjoyed having both of you on. I appreciate you working with Friends of the Boundary Waters for this. Uh, I wanna put a plug in um, to visit Listening Point. There's the Listening Point Foundation that you can, you know, they've done so much great work to kind of preserve and educate that. Um, and so if you haven't been there to, and you're interested in Sigurd Olson and his legacy, that's a really great place. Um, also to check out our website at Friends of the Boundary Waters. Um, if you're interested in kind of this continued fight for the wilderness. Um, you know, it's an everlasting battle, unfortunately, but um, one that we're grateful to be working on. Um, so we'll direct you to that website as well. And then finally, buy the book. It's really great. Um, really gives you an insight into some of the conversation today. Um, and again, I'll include all of those links in, in a follow-up email. Maya, thank you for putting this together. Doug, it's great to be here with you once again, and look forward to the next time we run into each other. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, David. And, and I'm going to throw in one more SIG, SIG quote because Maya just referred to the battle that continues to protect 
the Boundary Waters Canaria Wilderness, uh, threatened yeah. as it has been threatened for a century by new plans for development, particularly mining, particular, particularly copper sulfide mining. Please do what you can, folks, to support that battle. Sig Olson said in his exact words, the battle goes on endlessly and you have to do your part. Yeah. What a great note to end on. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I hope you all have a great night. Bye-bye. Thanks, David. Thanks, Maya. Thank you, everybody.